development and apiary. Uh, I work on our backend infrastructure. I'm an API architect. I work in a number of uh, different open source projects, particularly in the hypermedia API space. And I want to talk a little bit about the uh, API design lifecycle. Just out of curiosity, how many out here have ever used apiary? Okay, so probably about half. So I am going to talk some ideas. I'm going to share a little bit about how those things work in apiary. So this isn't really me trying to pitch a product, more just to give examples and uh, talk about sort of the mindset to approach API design holistically. Okay. So um, I don't know whether any of you read uh, papers by old uh, English computer scientist Leslie Lampert is a pioneer in distributed computing. And uh, this is a, a quote he made recently. I believe the best way to get better programs is to teach programmers how to think better. So our journey as developers is really learning how to think better. And so when we get exposed to new ideas and try those out, we don't always believe them, right? We don't always like them, but sooner or later, some of them we actually say, hey, that was a good idea. Um, this is another thought that I think is, uh, whether you think about it or not, I think it's really uh, a useful one. Architectures related to a set of constraints, they may be self-imposed that produce a set of favor favorable properties of the system. Now, one of the uh, uh, clearest examples in the API space is REST. Okay, REST is an architectural style. You know, it's not HTTP, it's REST. And, you have client-server model, and you have cacheability, and you have layerability, and you have a uniform interface and everything. And actually, if you do an HTTP API, you pretty much get all of that constrained because HTTP makes you to do that. But there's also in REST a little thing called hypermedia as the engine of application state. You get that in um, HTML, you get it in browsers, but you don't get it in APIs unless you choose to do it. And that particular constraint in REST architecture is what gives you loose coupling and evolvability. In other words, you can change your API and your clients don't break, just like you can change an API or uh, change a web page and a browser doesn't break. But that particular constraint, you'd have to choose to do it. So I'm going to talk about some ideas of things you can uh, constrain yourself to do, ways of thinking that actually produce favorable res results in your APIs. All right. So let's talk about one of these ideas. It's uh, the idea of design first. And um, <clears throat> some people say contract first. I think uh, we were talking in the pri pri previous discussion uh, about uh, customer contracts. But really, design first is an idea of a lot of stakeholders having a voice into the design process. Is it just developers? Or can your product manager, can tech writers actually get into the whole process of de designing an API and inputting on how that, that API may work. And do you have tools to make that? So there's this idea of top down versus bottom up. Uh, so there's some ecosystems in tooling where you can go put com comments in your code and you create your API and you generate documents or generate a contract out of your code. But the question is, is, is it even a good design? Or when do you find out if something's a good design? Because if I go write a bunch of code and put in a bunch of comments and everybody hates my API, I haven't really done myself or anybody a favor. So one of the things you want to do is actually start with getting the design that everybody agrees is a good one to start. Um, if you're going to go through all this effort of trying to create an API and design this and collaborate on this thing, you actually want to get the most bang for your buck out of uh, that effort. Any of you seen README.io or any API documentation through README.io? Okay. Well, it's very nice documentation format. You could theoretically go in and design your API there and a bunch of you know, endpoints. But all you can do is read that documentation. You can't reuse that effort. Unless you have a machine-readable description format that's undergirding all your design process, whatever you do, you do it once. And if you're going to write tests, you've got to go somewhere else and write something else. So you want an ecosystem and tools that allow you to reuse this effort over and over. And I'm going to show you some of that. And why do we do this? Because we like to write less code, right? That's why we have frameworks and things like this. We want things that we do something once and we get lots of opportunities to reuse it. Okay, so 
the best design of an API, okay, this is what a friend of mine who said, this isn't really, you know, I've got, if you've paid any attention in the API space, there's not an idea of a right API, but what's the best API? The best API is one where everybody who's involved in it actually likes this API, and there's been a bunch of voices. So it's not a right or wrong or architecture or paradigm that I'm trying to pitch, but it's more of a process that you can work together to arrive at an API. Now you can be in group think and create a bad API together, so there are some other things in, in I think there were some earlier talks about ideas about how to write good REST APIs. I'm not really going into that. But let me um, show you what this looks like a little bit in Apiary. So uh, this is this is uh, Apiary's editor, and one of the things about Apiary is it's basically just writing in Markdown a machine-readable format that allows you to actually describe your API. And right now, what you're looking at is the just the pure format, and you can effectively define different resource endpoints. Uh, you can go in and create the attributes that you expect to get that, query parameters, a lot of different things. And if you go in, there's a tutorial and, and um, uh, you can and you play with this and see it. We also have effectively out of this machine readable document or uh, language or description as you go through designing this, you actually have documentation that's being generated. And from that documentation, you actually have <coughs> code and samples and the ability to uh, interact with this as a mock service. So you go through your effort to actually design this API and write this markdown. You've already got documentation, you've got code generation, you've got sample light, you can go play with this. And I'll show you a little bit more of that later, but let's, uh, let's just make a change in here because I'm going to use this later. So I basically can go in and add uh, something new <coughs> to my body if I want to, and I'm going to do something wrong. Uh, this is a string, and it's required. Okay. Now, one of the nice things about Apiary is it basically helps you find out whether you do things that you shouldn't have done, and there's a bunch of feedback as, a, as an IDE, as a SaaS product, and this one's basically saying I haven't specified any value, uh, mainly because I put a colon, so something new. All right. So, Oops. So, in the uh, Apiary ecosystem, the way you go about um, starting the design process is you have this very human-friendly uh, document that's just written in Markdown that actually a product manager, if they read it, it makes sense to them. You're not forcing them to read some massive JSON blob or a bunch of YAML, which you and I can do that, and some of us prefer to do that, but other people in the process don't. Okay, so. Moving on, I'm just going to save that. So, prototyping. <clears throat> so, I just created this design document, and what does it look like? What kind of endpoints does it produce? Because this whole process, as much as I can sit there and write that documentation, what can maybe my client developer input into it? I mean, they can read the documentation like anybody else, but what if they want to visualize it? What if they want to fire up Postman or Curl and make some requests and be able to input into this? Um, so what you really should have in an ecosystem is real-time mocking or prototyping that you haven't written a bit of code, but you can actually see how your API is going to um, perform. And I sort of pointed to some of this already, but let me show you it in action. So if I go over into the documentation mode, so now this is uh, basically Apiary, if you go through all this effort, you can actually, you have hosted API docs for your API, you can, this is a public link, uh, people, you developers can come in and use this port. And um, I can go through the docs and review things and pick some API that I want to uh, try. And I have the ability to switch between a mock server, a debugging proxy, or actually the, the production server. And I can pick a PHP language if I want for code generation. And so as a client developer, I could just cut and paste this into my code and start seeing actually what happens. And if you look at, uh, if 
I select the mock server, you'll notice right here, this thing has created this private apiary mock URI. I can take and paste this right in. This client code is going to talk to a mock server. We didn't write anything. It's just sitting out there based on this API description that we did. But if I want to go and actually just try um, this, uh, I'm going to switch to the console, and I just want to try this resource, I can actually just go make the request and see what happens. And so I've got uh, a call, um, if we go up here, uh, pro, you know, question slash one, standard old rest stuff, uh, parameters, question ID, I can actually go in and change headers and do different things. But this is talking to the mock server, and um, this is just the sample data that I put in my API. And you can create multiple samples and actually have different scenarios just simply off your API description. I can actually, because this one's backed by a, um, a live service, I could just go straight to production, or this one here, which I'll show you in a second, a debugging proxy. I'm going to just call this resource. Uh, it basically, we can proxy your production call and compare it to what your actual API document says and what's going on there. And so if you notice here, I'm talking to this production thing, I'm not getting sample data, I'm getting live data here. All right, carry on. So, implementation. So I've gone through this effort to um, design my API. I've pulled a bunch of different stakeholders in. I've allowed client developers to be able to look at this, and we finally decided we like this API. One of the really interesting things, if you've done much uh, work with uh, distributed teams and, and uh, complex situations of having to write a service for, for some front end is, what happens when client developers are stuck waiting on service developers? They like start running ahead, writing a bunch of stuff that by the time the service developer catches up, it didn't really match. And then you've got all this kind of rewriting. So you want to have a system where client developers can just run off and write against whatever your server is while your, your back-end developers can actually write the service and, and have the minimal amount of change. And so, in an ecosystem where, in the tooling that we have, and, and Lodge is going to get up and uh, show some of uh, our uh, command line and, and CI testing, where basically you can test your API against this description document. Again, we're using it. But if you don't have an ecosystem like this, where effectively with a mock server, client developers can write their stuff, they can write the test, they can fire it up, they can try it. I was sitting in my office um, in San Francisco, and a new guy came in from another company. We were talking. He says, what company do you work for? I said, Apiary. He says, oh, I love Apiary. Saved us two months of work because we could go and write all our clients while the back end guys caught up because we could just use your mock server. And it's like, OK. So that was a sales pitch. But anyhow. Um, so effectively, you should have the ability to take all this design process and, and put it into test-driven and behavior-driven design. right? How about? You as a developer sitting down having a tool set, I've got this design and I just start implementing these APIs on the back end, I can run tests against it right off the bat using that same description doc. And you can do that in this kind of ecosystem. All right. Whoops. I'm not going to. OK. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to show you something at the end here. So. Documentation, auto-generated, you've seen that. It's interactive. You should get all this stuff for free for your hard work in doing design. And you should be able to validate. This is one thing that's rather interesting. I mean, how many of you actually have API documentation that drifts from your services? Ever had that happen to you? That what you have written in your code or what's coming out of the pipe is actually different than what you have up on your website? And unless somebody manually makes sure that happens, that's just what we do, because you just don't test your docs. You've got other things to do, and somebody else catches it one day or whatever. But you should have an ecosystem in the whole API design lifecycle that they never get out of sync, because you're testing the, that documentation right as you're testing your code. And a lot of you will show some of that. So just as I wrap up, last thing is ability to do monitoring. Can I? Um, 
do a post-deployment smoke test and actually take my API description and say, hey, is this thing doing what I said? You know, if I push the code up and I find out right away something happened and there was something weird in CI or whatever, I catch it. Can I do debugging? Can I do inspection? Can, can uh, people have an easy way to go in and see what's coming out of the API versus what they expected? So I'll show you one, one last thing here and then I'm going to wrap up. And that is, we have an inspector. And if you recall, the uh, last time I made a call, I made it th through our debugging proxy. And if you go in here and look at this, if you notice, at something is missing a required property. So I've basically taken my production request, put it through the debugging property, and compared it to the description. I added this thing called something. It was a required property. It's not there. And my inspector is pointing this out. So you have a lot of uh, ability to basically go in and use an API or the SQL system that you can pass your API through a proxy, figure out what's wrong, did I typo something in my documentation. You can actually run it against the mock server. But this isn't so much a pitch about API as it is about a mindset. If you can see, I go through the process of designing. If I use a machine-readable description format, I can reuse it over and over and over in my whole life cycle. So that at the end, when I got this deployed API, I'm very confident that all these parts are in sync. I've been able to make things go fast for my developers because they can write tests right against, they can write code right against it and have test feedback in the whole ecosystem. So um, I think that's about as much as I'd like to say. Um, we're hiring at Apiary. Um, and uh, if you have any questions, Happy to talk to you. Now, Lodja has something he wants to share. Maybe we do all the questions at the end. Would that be better? OK. Já jsem připravil takový krátký demo, který vám ukáže vlastně náš nástroj pro testování API, který se jmenuje DRED. A vlastně mám tady nějaký API, který je velmi jednoduchý. Má to nějaký vstupní bod. Je to podobný typ API, co ukazoval Mark. Máte tady nějaké otázky. Uh, tady se můžeme podívat, co to tam vrací. Vrací to nějaký váš uh, oblíbený PHP framework, tak tady jsou nějaké hlasování. A tady to asi vyhrálo nete, tady má nejvíc počet hlasů. A tady můžete vlastně vidět výsledky, tady můžete volit pro jednotlivé varianty, uh, vypsat všechny otázky, vytvořit novou otázku. Je to takový velmi jednoduchý API. Uh, uh, a tady k tomu je potom repozitář, kde najdete potom posunu na Twitter v kompletní verzi se vším a můžete se na to podívat. Já si zapomněl hrát. A já ukážu. A já tady mám command line. Řekněte mi, jestli to vidíte dobře. Já mám tool, který se jmenuje Dread. Ten se nainstaluje pomocí, pomocí NPM. Je to, je to vlastně napsaný v Node.js, ale dá se to používat jakoby s každým jazykem. A já to tady mám nainstalovaný a mám tady nějakou prvotní, prvotní verzi, která ještě nemá vlastně implementovaný žádný ten PHP backend. Mám tu konfiguraci toho dreadu, ten, když dáte dread init, tak máte takovou, takovou konfiguraci, kde on se vás ptá na jednotlivé kroky a vytvoří to potom dread YAML, který vlastně umožňuje, umožňuje vám vlastně jednoduše nastavit všechny ty věci testování, které jdou z command line, ale je to jednodušší, když to máte jednou nastavený, potom už jenom pouštět jednu příkaz dread. Co je důležité, pouští to samo server, takže já tady pro testování používám ten interní PHP server, co je od 5 čtyřky. Potom to počká 3 vteřiny a pustí to, to testování. Další důležitá věc je vlastně ten blueprint, vlastně ta definice toho, jak on to má testovat. On si všechno přečte z toho blueprintu, vytvoří ty requesty, které máte v té definici, ale pošle je na tu vaši implementaci a ten endpoint, na který se bude dotazovat, je definovaný tady. Takže já teď nemám žádnou, tady nemám nic 
definovanýho a když pustím ten, ten, ten test, tak uvidíte, že nám všechno spadne. To bude velmi jednoduchý a pět jich uh, failuje. Jo? Když implementuju jeden z těch, jeden z těch endpointů, takže tady mám nějakou, nějakou implementaci, teda bohužel ne v nete, ale mám tady implementaci v Silexu. A to je nějaký moc, to tam je. Tak, a to je nějaká finál verze. A mám tady nějaký definovaný ty jednotlivé endpointy a co k tomu vrací. Tak když ty teď pustím, tak už asi toho tam bude víc, než jsem chtěl. Ale... Jo, teď to prošlo všechno. No, Co tak to už byla ta finální implementace, jsem nějak špatně přepnul ten checkout. A vidíte, že on vám tady píše, že výsledky já můžu vidět, vidět na nějaký URL. Když na něj kliknu, tak se mi otevře web browser a vidím tady uh, v testech, což je nějaká naše beta verze zatím tohohle inspektora. Ono to umí na tu command line vypisovat, ale umí to právě posílat ty API. A já tady vlastně můžu jednotlivý ty endpointy prohlížet. Vidím vlastně ten rozdíl mezi tím skutečným a to, co bylo v tom blueprintu. Víte, že tady jsou, protože je to skutečná implementace nějaký hlavičky navíc, třeba verze PHP a další aktuální datum a věci. Tady je verze toho dreadu, která taky není poslední, použil jsem nějakou starší. Jo, takže tady máte ty jednotlivé pointy a je vidět. A tady vidíte, že to mám nějaký lokál, to znamená, že to běží, že jsem tady se vrátím, tady to třeba selhalo, takže vidíte, že na začátku jsem měl faily všechny. A to je jeden možnost běhu, je, je to lokální, že z lokálu, když já na tom pracuju, tak si pouštím ty testy pro tu implementaci a jsou tady. Druhá možnost je potom, když mám integraci s tím CI, takže mi to posílá CI. Takže vidíte, tady jsou nějaké výstupy z Travis CI, tady se Circle CI. A v tom repozitory tam vidíte, jak se to docela jednoduše implementuje. A není to nic složitýho, prostě jenom pod, co jiný potřebujete, je vlastně, tady jsem navolil, že PHP, nainstaloval jsem dread, pustil jsem kompouze a vycekoval jsem ten dread zase. Je to jednoduché, všechno se pošle, všechno je v tom konfiguráku. A další věc je potom tady ten, ta záložka live, která vlastně já ji nemám, ale zprovozněnou, ale když byste udělali tu finální implementaci, tak vlastně tím můžete dělat ten monitoring, jo? že jste schopní vlastně kontrolovat tu vaši skutečnou implementaci, že vám dělá přesně to, co chce. Pustí to, tam, pustí to tam vlastně to samý, ten live to spíš jako berte, jako že to je staging třeba, protože tam potřebujete ty dummy data, nebo potřebujete mít tady strápku, potom pomocí tady hůlku upravovat ty data, aby třeba když tam máte real time timestampy, tak samozřejmě v tom dokumentu máte statický, máte tam jeden datum, tak aby vám to fungovalo třeba s reálným serverem, tak jsou tam takzvaný hůky, pomocí kterých můžete vlastně přepisovat třeba ty timestampy, aby vám to dávalo smysl, že reálný server vám vrátí vždycky aktuální. V tom blueprintu, to je statický dokument, máte jedno definovaný datum, takže s tím se dá poradit pomocí těch hůků. To samé třeba, já jsem řešil implementaci třeba v Node.js a v Node.js třeba vám neudělá application JSON, ale vždycky napíše application JSON UTF8 prostě. Jo, to tam každý jinou, je server přidává, PHP server, hrubý server vám to dělat nebude. Jo, prostě takovéhle věci se těma hukama dají krásně ošetřit. Je to vlastně plus javascriptový opor, kde si můžete vlastně ty expected a ty real hlavičky i to body, vlastně můžete si je upravovat podle toho, jak to pro ten vás test je je užitečný a další věc, kterou to umí, je takzvaná stash. Jestli znáte git stash, tak tohle je něco podobného. Je to kvůli tomu, že když máte vlastně víc těch kroků, tak vy si můžete vynutit třeba to, aby první byl ten create a potom ten list a potom ten delete, aby se vám nestalo, 
že vám to pustí v pořadí, že si nejdřív smažete ty věci, které potom budete chtít vylistovat z té skutečný. Takže můžete dát to skutečný pořadí, můžete dokonce vlastně třeba z getu to IT si uložit a použít ho v dalším volání prostě v tom tredu. Takové možnosti už tam dneska jsou. Takže se s tím dá poměrně dělat dost věcí. Dá se třeba právě z toho vytáhnout nějaký IT, který se potom použije v dalším kroku a podobně. Jo, co, což normálně ten statický blueprint neumožňuje, takže je potřeba pro to testování tomu dát nějakou větší pružnost, kterou děláme pomocí těch hůků a buď to se pouštějí před celou sadou nebo před každým tím testem. Jo, je tam before all, before each, je tam before klasický před každým tím. Takže všechno najdete na tom dreadu, na dokumentaci dread read, uh, read dots. A ten link já pošlu potom ještě na Twitter, vidíte, tam je veškerá dokumentace k tomu dostupná, tenhle projekt je kompletně open source. A... Jo, 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 ten můžu ukázat, sice asi... Tady je vlastně třeba příklad toho přepisu, toho, toho charsetu. Server posílá application JSON charset to 8 a já to potřebuju, aby tam byl ten application JSON, takže ten tu expected verzi přepíšu na tu, kterou posílá ten server. Jo, je to velmi jednoduchý v JavaScriptu, jenom takhle se napíše takový lehůk a dají se s tím dělat další věci, příklady jsou potom když tak dokumentaci. Jo, kdybyste měli s Apiary jakýkoliv problém, nebojte se využít support at Apiary a jeho e-mail a máme zdarma pro všechny vývojáře support, takže když máte jakýkoliv problém, tak se nebojte zeptat. Jediný, co je napsat to anglicky, protože a, nesedí tam jenom Češi. Jo, i tam sedí. <laughs> Ale jenom jde. No, ono to je těžké někoho z Indie nabrat, takže to, to je fakt opravdu ne, pro nás obtíží. <laughs> Dobrý, tak to je za mě všechno. Tak jestli nějaké otázky. I think it's for you, Mark. It's in English? Yeah. Start. No, let me start that. So I can see. Ah, so these are, these are uh, probably people that have been in use in API Blueprint. So uh, relation is something that's being introduced into API Blueprint. Uh, in the, so API Blueprint has a resource um, uh, based uh, approach to HTTP APIs versus just pure endpoints. The idea behind a relation is moving towards some ideas in hypermedia that actually a resource could have links or relations to other resources in the context of it. So in apiary, uh, a relation is being introduced. Say there's a book, you could have a relation for an author you could define in the context of a book resource the actual um, author endpoint that you would call to get the related resource. If that's answering the question, I hope it is. We're moving towards actually being able to do hypermedia APIs where it's driven by link relations and resources, and so this is part of what we're building into it. Well, actually, we support hypermedia APIs right now, but um, only by basically building samples that are in the proper format, but ultimately it'll be completely dynamic for known hypermedia types. Okay. So uh, with parent, you're talking about, this one looks like it's um, talking about parameters for the URI and query parameters versus attributes for the body. So parameters in API Blueprint are uh, basically uh, either path or query parameters, depending on what's templated in the URI. The attributes property is actually if there's body. So that's where you would define um, a body using the attributes property. And this is... 
this limitation I think for content type that you can use the 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 X, uh, only application JSON. Uh, yeah, I think I think all in, so. Some of this sounds like it's driven by the new MSON format that we're introducing, which is Markdown syntax for object notation. I don't know if you noticed in my sample that uh, basically we were defining objects and attributes with some kind of a syntax um, that's required in different things. It's much more compact than doing it in YAML where you've got to have a line for everything you're doing. But uh, we only support application JSON bodies right now. I think we may support formula yeah. and code encoded as well, but that's it for now. All right. So uh, I think this is talking more about the reusability of definitions in API Blueprint, if that's correct. That's also something that we're introducing. Um, if you go, uh, I presume these slides, I can give you these slides and, and you can go in and look at these polls APIs and some of this. Um, we're reusing resource definitions. So if you saw that the list of questions had a definition of an array of question resource, we're actually building in data structures and the ability to reuse data structures through the API to dry it out. So um, I'm not exactly, myself I haven't solved that one, but um, I'm, I think you can actually do it right now with what we have in Amazon. Uh, most valuable feature of Steve Geary versus Swagger. So uh, I would say the most valuable aspect of Apiary is the complete holistic uh, life cycle. If you go into the Swagger world right now, they don't have mock servers. Uh, people are starting to write them. Apogee actually just wrote one. Swagger is actually just starting to catch up with a lot of the life cycle stuff that we've done. I don't believe uh, they have anything close to dread in the ecosystem where you take Swaggers. And again, I know I have some friends I know that are working on that. But I think one of the, the real wins is that the apiary ecosystem is more inviting to a broader uh, spectrum of stakeholders in the sense that um, product owners and tech writers can actually get into the api design process and if you look at swagger right now people that are writing tools could write better docs because the swagger docs are really very limited in the amount of ability to put metadata in there there's there's some tooling out there so there's a lot of advantages around the the uh, the complete feature set, the, the human friendly aspect of it. And also, um, you know, again, it goes back to the top down versus bottom up. A lot of swagger uh, people that use swagger, it's sort of back to this mindset thing. Oh, you know, I'm a developer, I'm gonna write this API in the code and I'll generate docs versus a contract. First mindset where I've really gone and thought it out. Now, of course you can do that with swagger, but it's actually not the typical way they do things. So hopefully that's answering that. Mm, that one I can't answer. Ty testy jdou používat hned, jakoby ten dread je uvolněný. To, co jsem ukazoval já, tomu říkáme nějaký reporter, API reporter, který je teď v beta verzi a když napíšete na support API IO, že bude chtít být nějaký beta testeři tohodle, tak určitě vám nějak ten přístup dokážeme zařídit. So, uh, th this is this is bottom up effectively that I've written these classes and, and generating a, a blueprint per se from it. Um, we haven't gone this particular approach because of the philosophy of design first and that, you know, uh, that, that particular paradigm, but I will say that we're working on a Swagger to API uh, a Blueprint converter right now. So effectively, people that are doing sort of bottom-up stuff with Swagger annotation will actually be able to create blueprints and hook right in and go forward. So, yeah, that's that's not on our roadmap to actually do that uh, anytime soon, but we are talking about it. But the complexity of creating a whole new um, annotation version that you would have to use we may just reuse Swagger and say, hey, if you want to do that, do it in you know, Swagger annotation and we'll, our tooling will generate a blueprint. Okay.